Welcome back to the lab, everyone. Today we're looking at the bones of the thorax and the vertebral column. All right, so let's talk about the cervical vertebra. The cervical vertebra make the first seven vertebra, the vertebral column. We have a small vertebral body right here and we have the spinous process. So the vertebral body will be anterior, spinous process, posterior. Uh, but something that's really interesting about the cervical vertebra is that um, some of them have what's called a bifid or forked spinous process. So that's one way if you're just having to identify one quickly by looking at it. If you see that bifid spinous process, you know you're looking at a cervical vertebra. Additionally, a cervical vertebra have these holes on either side, and those are called the transverse foramina. So if you think transverse means towards the side, and foramina is another term for opening. And when you um, take my class for AMP2, we study the blood vessels. We will relate this to these structures. Uh, because the vertebral arteries run through these transverse foramina. Um, the only difference is C7. C7 will have these transverse foramina, but they're smaller, and uh, the vertebral arteries do not run through them. And then C7 does not have a bifid spinous process, so the spinous process will look more similar to a thoracic vertebra, which we'll look at in just a minute. Um, the first two cervical vertebra, C1 and C2, which are the atlas and the axis, are special looking. And so let's take a closer look at those two. Here we have the atlas, which is C1, or the first cervical vertebra. You can see it's pretty flat and wide. Different parts of the atlas include the anterior arch, which is on this side, which means this is the front side of the bone. And then we have the posterior arch. That is the larger one, as you can see. We have those transverse processes and then the transverse foramen as well. These surfaces right here are actually called the superior articular facets, and these articulate with the occipital condyles uh, of the base of the skull. So I have another model, and I will show you in a little bit just how that looks put together. This is the axis, um, also known as C2, or the second cervical vertebra. And the thing that immediately tells you this is the axis is this little projection here called the dens, or the odontoid process. And I like that word odontoid process because it makes me think of a tooth-like structure. We also have a spinous process here, so that tells you that this is the posterior side, which means the dens, or the odontoid process, is on the anterior side. Additionally, we have these uh, articular facets, so these would be the superior articular facets, which will articulate with or make contact with the inferior articular facets of the atlas. That creates another joint that I will show you on another model. Okay, so here we have this model, which is pretty neat because it shows us how C1 and C2 articulate with each other and the base of the skull. So remember, before we get started, let's always orient ourselves with directional terms. So if we were to turn it like so, we notice, okay, those are those spinous processes which are on the posterior side. So that means this is anterior, which makes this the left side and the right side. Looking at the base of the skull here, you'll note that foramen magnum, which means large opening. And then on either side of that are these occipital condyles. The occipital condyles, this one being the left, this one being the right, are covered with hyaline cartilage. And remember that hyaline cartilage 
is often called an articular cartilage because it is going to cover bony parts that articulate with one another. So we don't have bone on bone because that'd be really painful. And so these occipital condyles will articulate with these superior articular surfaces of the atlas. Remember the atlas is our first vertebra. It's that flat bone right there. A way that I like to teach students to remember that is if you think of Greek mythology, the character Atlas, who held the world on his shoulders. Well, if our head is going to be the globe or the world, then it sits on top of the Atlas, or the Atlas is holding up our globe. This joint right here created by those occipital condyles, and then these are superior articular surfaces, um, create what is called the atlanto-occipital joint. And it's actually a synovial joint and a condylar synovial joint to be specific, which means there are multiple planes of mo movement, um, it'd be flexion, extension, abduction, adduction, and circumduction. Um, what we commonly think of when we think of that atlanto-occipital joint is the motion when we are nodding our heads and we're saying, Yes, that joint accounts for um, about uh, 35 degrees of that motion, uh, which is pretty cool to think about. And then if we were to look at the, at, uh, excuse me, the atlas with the axis, so C1 and C2, those will create another joint. So remember the axis is going to be that vertebra that has that odontoid process. That's how you very quickly tell what it is. And the inferior articular surfaces will touch the superior articular surfaces of the axis. So when those two bones are like that, there are actually three uh, joints here. One is going to be the one created by the dens in the anterior portion of the atlas, and then the other two are those articular surface surfaces. So this joint is referred to as the atlantoaxial joint, and it's actually a pivot joint. So when we think of shaking our heads no, that is due to that joint right there. So again, hopefully, seeing all this put together helps make sense of the order and why C1 and C2 are such special vertebra. Okay, let's take a look at the thoracic vertebra. So here we have the vertebral body. Opposite of that, we have the spinous process. And then we have two transverse processes. In situ, or as it exists in the body, the vertebral body will be anterior and the spinous process will be posterior. So the way I like to teach students how to remember the directions on the vertebra are take your finger and run it down the midline of your back. Those little bumps you feel are going to be those spinous processes. The transverse processes make sense because remember transverse means out towards the sides. So let's look at some other features of the vertebra. On the thoracic vertebra, remember, we're gonna have a lot of ribs that attach to this. And so we have these things called facets. And a facet is going to be a place where another bone is going to articulate or touch that area. So we have these two demi facets right here. And these are actually called costal facets. Costal because that reminds us we're, that we're talking about the ribs. So a rib is going to articulate with this superior demi facet and this transverse costal facet right here. The rib below will uh, articulate with the inferior costal facet. So again we have a superior and inferior and a transverse. Whatever rib number we're looking at, that will articulate with the same vertebra number, and it will kind of go like this.
the rib below it, so higher in number, will articulate with that inferior costal facet. We have two other facets as well. We have um, a superior articular process with the facet. Remember, process is something that kind of like sticks upwards. So we have the paired superior articular facets. And then opposite that, we have two inferior articular facets. And those are actually going to articulate with other vertebra. So if I were to grab another thoracic vertebra, the inferior facets of this vertebra will articulate with the superior facets of this one. So when we put it together like so, do you see how we have that connection right there? So again, putting it all together helps us understand how the thoracic vertebra fit together. Okay, let's tie this in with the nervous system a little bit. This opening right here is a foramen. And if you remember that a foramen means a hole or an opening, and we think, why do we want this hole or opening right here? Well, that's actually going to house the spinal cord. So whenever we get to the nervous system and we're looking at a cross section of that spinal cord, it will fit right inside there. Additionally, when we have two vertebrae together, so we can't really see it when we have the vertebra by itself, but when we put two together, we have created another foramen, another hole. And this is actually called the intervertebral foramen. When, again, when we look at the nervous system and we study spinal nerves, we'll see that those spinal nerves are going to come out laterally through these intervertebral foramen. Additionally, uh, we have blood supply um, vessels that go through that foramen as well. Those are called radicular arteries. But the openings have a purpose and studying that helps us to tie together the skeletal system to the nervous system. So remember that we have 12 thoracic vertebra. We have ribs that attach to the thoracic vertebra and a way that you can easily tell that you're looking at a thoracic vertebra specifically is that they resemble a giraffe. Okay, so here's a lumbar vertebra. Um, basically the same parts. We have the vertebral body, which is anterior. We have a spinous process that is posterior, and we still have those two transverse processes that go out towards the sides. You may have noticed that the lumbar vertebra is actually gonna have a blunt or a hatchet-shaped spinous process. We still have the articular processes with the, those um, facets. And remember that if I were to have two here, that the inferior of one is going to articulate with the superior of the other, just like that. So that's how it fits together. Remember that we have five lumbar vertebra. And a way that you can remember what it looks like is that lumbar vertebra resemble moose. This is the sacrum and the coccyx. The sacrum is a set of five fused vertebra. This right here is the posterior side of the sacrum and this is the anterior side. Um, we have these openings called sacral foramina. And remember just anytime you have uh, a a hole or an opening in a bone, that means something like a blood vessel or a nerve is going to run through that. Um, other things on here, um, this part up here we call the sacral canal and when we go over the nervous system and we're tying in the meningeal layers and the vertebral column and all that stuff, um, that's where that enters. And then kind of the end point is what we call the sacral hiatus. And again, once we're in the nervous system and we're, you're hearing terms like phylum terminale, things like that, that is where um, 
that will be associated with. So we can, again, we can kind of tie the skeletal system to the nervous system. Um, here, so inferior to that, just this small section down here, this is the coccyx, or what is commonly referred to as the tailbone. And the amount of bones actually varies within folks. So anywhere from three to five uh, fused bones here uh, make up the coccyx. Thank you so much for checking out this video. Don't forget to hit like, subscribe, hit that little bell icon so you don't miss any new content I release. And as always, check out my Instagram page at The Anatomy Gal for nerdy goodness. I'll see you next time.